All right, so welcome back to Computer Science E75. My name is David Malin, and this is lecture one, where we dive into PHP. So though some folks stayed at home today to tune in online, the course has grown since last week. We're up to about 142 students. Uh, so we're up from two teaching fellows to six or seven. So I will in allow me to take a moment to introduce one of them. Jesse Cohen, do you want to come on up and say hello for a second? Hi, I'm Jesse. I am a junior at Harvard College. Um, concentrating in computer science. All right, excellent. That's already a better introduction than our, our last week introduction. So thank you, Jesse. Last week's were quite brief. Uh, so Project Zero is now in your hands. And as promised, this is a fairly low key one that's meant really just to give us some time to ramp up in the first weeks of the course, to arm you with as much material as we can so that we can dive headfirst into Project One. So as you'll see, if you haven't looked over the PDF that's been online uh, today already, this is going to have you one by a domain name, as promised last week, for just a few dollars, ten dollars, or thereabouts, unless you go for something a little more vain, like a .tv domain, as we have. Um, you're going to be asked to point your uh, your registrar, presumably GoDaddy's name servers, to us, so that everything uh, points ultimately to CS75.net server. And then ultimately, you're going to log into your new found account on CS75.net, which you will get as part of submitting this first Project Zero. And you will then be on your way to making a quick and dirty uh, home page at yourdomainname.com so that at least you have a placeholder or framework with which to then dive in with projects uh, one and onward, which will indeed be the dynamic website. So if you're entering the course again, as we said last week, with a little bit of discomfort with XHTML, with CSS, I mean, actually throw yourself perhaps into this first project and use it as a forced opportunity to really bring yourself up to a greater comfort level. But if you're already comfortable with this stuff, that's fine. There's uh, more good stuff to come. So. Just to give you a taste of what to expect, um, if you've not used a, an internet registrar before, uh, there are some that are a little less confusing than this one. So GoDaddy has the uh, fortune of being one of the biggest, but also one of the most ridiculous. Like It's not even totally clear how you buy a domain name on this website. But if you can muddle your way through it, though you are welcome to use another one, you're going to do something along the lines of, as I said last week, typing in something like mailinrouge.com, hitting go, eventually putting that uh, domain name into your shop shopping cart, and then ultimately getting uh, link after link after link of attempted upsells. So click no thanks, no thanks, no thanks, until you get to the shopping cart. And at that point, you're probably going to want to change the drop down to say not two years, but just one year is good enough for me. And ultimately, you'll be able to check out from this website, and you'll be up and running with your own domain name. But what's more interesting after that, technically, is the following. So I, in advance, have signed up for an account. Uh, for our extension school's use here. I'm going to go ahead and log in now to my GoDaddy account. And I, I kind of got upsold myself, I'll admit. I decided, God, I, you know, it's great to have mailinrouge.com, but what if someone tries to get the .net or .org equivalent for whatever stupid reason? So I got a little upsold. So if I now log into my GoDaddy account, as you will for Project Zero, go to Domains and then My Domains. And this PDF will walk you through this process pretty precisely. You're going to see a screen a little like this, where it shows you your presumably one or more domains. And at this point, you're going to click on the domain name that you've purchased. In this case, I'll focus on mailinrouge.com. And then you're going to have a panel of sorts where you can configure a whole bunch of options. The only one you're going to care about for this purpose, and really in general for getting a new website up and running, is clicking on the name servers link. So mine's already been pre-prepared here. Notice that my name servers are apparently already ns1.cs75.net and ns2. Obviously, it's not going to come that way out of the box, but what I did quite simply was click on this name servers link here. I got a screen a little like this. And then I was prompted for, OK, well, what do you want your name servers to be? And all I had to tell GoDaddy was click on custom name servers. And then I typed in those two host names that I mentioned just a moment ago. Then I click Submit. Then I waited some number of hours, or up to, say, 72 hours, just to, minimize, or just to avoid any DNS propagation delays. And then voila, I was up and running. Now, I can suggest this. As excited as you may be to try to get your brand new domain line up and running, resist the temptation to type your own domain name into your browser and hit Enter until you've done this step, simply because if you try to pull up your domain name before you've actually told uh, GoDaddy and in turn the rest of the internet where your site's going to be living, the IP address you're going to get back is going to belong not to us but to 
GoDaddy. You're going to be directed to one of their parked servers, which means you get this nice banner ad saying, Don't, this domain name was just purchased. Here's a big link to GoDaddy.com. So what's going to happen, though, is that that IP address is going to get cached in your uh, own browser or in your own operating system, maybe even your own ISP. And you've kind of then screwed yourself for you know, maybe a day or two until the DNS propagation goes away. Now, it's, imposs it's possible that you could, in fairly technical ways, like try to flush your DNS cache and power to you if you know how to do this and want to do this. But it's an interesting, perhaps, lesson from even the stuff we talked about last week that you know, if you're a little overeager, you're going to paint yourself into a corner for at least the first couple of days. But once you've clicked Submit and or clicked OK here, and the changes have actually made their way through GoDaddy servers and in turn out to the internet, you're eventually going to be able to pull up your own domain, mailinrouge.com. The IP address that will then be returned is going to belong to CS75.net, but not quite, because there's one more step. So trick question, right? You, it's fine if you tell GoDaddy that my server is going to be hosted on CS75.net, but you kind of have to tell us, too. All right? And so this is what Project Zero is going to have you do. We provide you with the URL in this spec of a survey that you're going to fill out uh, on the course's own website. We're going to ask you for your name, your email address, your username, and so forth, and your domain name. And then what the teaching fellows and I are going to do is go ahead and create you an account, a username and password, on CS75.net. And then you're going to be able to log in to the following. So you will never again, at least so far as the course is concerned, touch GoDaddy again. But you're instead going to go to panel.cs75.net. So I mentioned last week this idea of a, a web panel, just kind of a nice user-friendly way of interfacing with the server. Well, um, curiously enough, between last week and this week, our SSL certificate expired. And rather than fix the problem, I rationalized, what better way than to teach an example than to leave it this way, at least for now. So you may see this, especially with Firefox. Frankly, this could not look more cryptic. And frankly, the hoops Firefox makes you jump through are beyond idiotic, because this is not an uncommon problem. To avoid this manually, what I need to tell my browser, Firefox here is, um, forgive this expired SSL certificate. And we'll talk about SSL a bit more in future lectures. But for now, know that this is the means by which cryptography is implemented between web browser and web server. And frankly, I mean, even coming at this from a security background, this is all more of a marketing thing than anything these days. Uh, our 1995 or 2995 that we spent last year now needs to be respent so that we can renew this certificate and install it in our server. And only then will the world's browsers say, oh, this is a trusted website. Now, mind you, most anyone in the world can buy an SSL certificate, no matter how good or bad, good or evil that website is. So frankly, I think this is all rather a bit of a farce. But from our perspective in this course, we'll actually give you a better understanding technically of what's going on here in a future lecture and also how you might tinker with this on your own website. For now, the hoops you must jump through are click add an exception, click again, add an exception, click get certificate, click confirm security exception, and then finally does Firefox let you go through. So the folks at Google have been a little friendlier. They kind of dumb it down in a good way and say, do you want to proceed anyway or back to safety? If I go ahead here and click proceed anyway, I will in fact reach panel.cs75.net. But notice they've at least tried to warn me that, hey, this isn't necessarily a safe connection. But even then, it's still encrypted. It's just I haven't paid my dues. So more on this in the future. But um, we'll go ahead in the meantime and take care of this so that you don't have to deal with this headache yourself. But once you reach this fairly uh, simple looking place, you're going to log in with the accounts that we will provide you in a return email that you will receive from the course's bot upon submitting this particular specification. And then you're going to see this so-called direct admin panel. So again, there's a lot of these. Th there's a few popular ones out there. cPanel and Plesk are probably the the two most popular, also most of the ex uh, two of the most expensive, and I would argue two of the most complicated. So what's been particularly appealing to me about this interface, Direct Admin, is that it's really, really simple. And there's really not much uh, struggling you need to do to get real work done. So we talked about one such work last week. You're going to log into this panel for the first time. And we are going to have pre-populated your account, and in turn our server, with some DNS records. What, are prob what is at least one record? we have probably pre-created for this guy named Malin, whose domain is apparently malinrouge.com. 
So we've created an A record, and that A record probably maps the domain name mailinrouge.com to whatever the IP address is of our particular server. And this again is something that TFs and I will do via an automated process, but only once you've completed one, step one at GoDaddy, and step two, submitting your survey to us, and we will then respond with an email with an account, um, will this actually work? And in fact, it does now. If I click DNS management, remember that we got a little playful um, in past lectures with super news and such, but there's a lot of default entries here. And what you'll see is that you too will get a mailinrouge.com or equivalent A record, and you might get a whole bunch of others. For mail, for instance, there's a webmail service that the server automatically provides for you. Notice that the script we run apparently pre creates www as well as a host name just by convention, but you can delete that. But I would at least caution for the earliest projects. If you're not quite sure what you're doing, it's fine to tinker, delete, ad nauseum, but write down the changes you're deleting so that we don't have to go in and recreate these things for you. But what you will see for projects one, two, and three is one of the first instructions in future specifications are going to be go ahead and create a new, domain, a new subdomain within your domain because each of your individual projects are going to exist within their own subdomains and in turn their own subdirectories. And you're going to do that partly by just typing some commands or creating a folder, but also partly via DNS. So this is what awaits you. And hopefully, this quick overview at least will give you some more comfort when you sit down and do it on your own that you know exactly how all of these pieces begin to fit together. So any questions on anything last week or tonight's teaser on Project Zero? So we're all going to basically have our own individual space here in direct admin? Yes, you will. You'll all have your own accounts and in turn own disk space and bandwidth uh, available to you on this server. No, you won't. So you get a little sandbox in isolation that uh, ties your domain name to your particular username, and that's it. We, the staff, can see everything, but you all see, like here, just your own stuff. Other questions? No? All right. So let's dive in. So tonight is about introducing PHP and ultimately the dynamism that's been promised. But where is this code that we're going to be writing actually going to be running? And how does all of this, um, how does the code you're going to be writing actually get executed? Well, last week we talked about the high levels of stuff going across the internet and HTTP and web traffic. And we said that this is the protocol, the language that web browser and web server use to speak to one another. And one of the most useful tools we preached last week that hopefully will become a useful debugging tool for you was that uh, Firefox plugin, live HTTP headers, because it really lets you see what's going across the wire. So if we trust for now that last week sort of went down smooth and you understand that hitting enter on your computer makes uh, results in a request going out on the internet to resolve a host name to an IP address, and then that IP address is contacted with that string get space slash index.html and so forth, hopefully some what will be increasingly familiar syntax. Finally, that request hits a web server that's on the other end. So if you are person A, the web server is person B. So one of the most popular web server products out there these days is Apache, uh, if only because it's free. And it um, comes with almost every available Linux distribution. And even if it doesn't, it's very easy to install this thing. So it's freely available software. It scales incredibly well, which means it has been fine-tuned over the years by some really generous people and really smart people to be very high performing, so thousands of requests per second and upwards. So the alternative to this, say, in a Windows environment might be what? Yeah, so IIS. So you can pretty much do anything with IIS on Windows that you can with Apache. One upside of this is that it's free. Um, and one downside of it is that it, well, actually, it also runs on Windows platforms. So um, I, we won't get into any religious debates in this course. But the upside of this is that it's available almost everywhere. Um, certainly, if you're choosing some commercial web host, odds are what you're getting is some form of Apache installation. What's nice about knowing this is not so much so that you can tell people, well, my web server runs Apache, because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. The content's all the same. But you can do some powerful things with it. And one of the features that was introduced years ago into Apache and then in turn IIS was this notion of virtual hosting. And what did we mean by virtual hosting last week? What does it mean to? Yeah, so browsers these days are now behaving in such a way that besides just contacting an IP address and saying, give me index.html, they're also providing a hint that says, by the way, give me index.html from the host called www.mailinrouge.com or cnn.com and so forth. So in other words, when I just pulled up, actually, I'm not sure if I pulled this up uh, last week. If I go ahead to mailinrouge.com, 
we see my Photoshop handiwork there. But if I now pull up, whoops, if I now pull up that live HTTP headers plugin, go ahead and just do a simple reload to see what it went across the wire. Notice that the first request that went across was this get forward slash HTTP slash 1.1, a whole bunch of stuff that I certainly didn't type myself. But the second line is perhaps interesting because it says host colon and then www.mailinrouge.com. And this is the hint to the receiving web server as to um, what website is being requested. And a little teaser here as it relates to security, there's a gotcha with using SSL. You actually need a unique IP address dedicated to a website that is using SSL. The reason being some of this stuff ends up being encrypted. And you have sort of a chicken and the egg problem. If you don't know what host's being requested, that host can't actually decrypt the information to then see, oh, this is in fact for me. So one of the unfortunately expensive, uh, uh, one of the costs behind running an SSL-based website is that you have to have an available IP address. So this is not something you tend to get for free in commercial web hosts. Usually you end up paying an additional dollar per month or five dollars per month, certainly as the IP address space these days becomes ever more scarce. So a little tuck that away for now but more on that when we focus on SSL. So here is an excerpt from the config file on a Linux box on our server that makes mailinrouge.com happen and makes your own website in a few days' time happen. So there is this very well-known configuration file on a typical machine running Apache, and it's called httpd.conf for configuration. And HTTPD stands for the HTTP daemon, AKA server. It's kind of a Linuxism. So this config file, which can actually be broken up into multiple smaller files and then all included together just for convenience, has an entry like this for mailinrouge.com that was created automatically when the staff and I created my particular account on our server. So this is an excerpt from a really big text file. And it's similar in spirit to a little XHTML fragment. It's got some open tags and closed tags just by convention. But notice that the first thing it says is, hey, Apache, here is a virtual host. And that host is going to live on the following IP address, 64.whatever, and then colon 80. What's the significance of that last part? Yeah, so that's the port number. So if you're familiar with the, if you have a networking background and you know a little something about uh, the uh, uh, network layer, the transport, or rather the transport layer, TCP or UDP, all these internet services like the web and email are uniquely identified by convention by some specific integer. And in the case of the web traffic, it's the number 80. So this is saying on this server, even though there's thousands of possible ports a server, a software-based server can be listening on, this very specifically is saying just listen on port 80. And in fact, that is the convention. All right, so this is now saying to the Apache web software, web server software, all right, so listen on this IP address and on this port, aka it's, it's a socket, essentially. And the name I want to give to this virtual host is www.mailinrouge.com. But you know what? I also want there to be an alias of just mailinrouge.com. So again, in the spirit of virtual hosting, if you see a host colon header coming in across the wire that says mailinrouge.com or www.mailinrouge.com, just give that to me. It's the same host. I want, it's, I want my response to that request governed by the same configuration. Well, what's going to happen here next? Well, there's some fluffy stuff that's not all that interesting. Apparently, this is where you can specify the webmaster's address. Why is this useful? Well, if you've ever pulled up a bogus web page on a server and you get that very you know, 1990s style error message saying file not found, then there's a horizontal rule and it says webmaster at foo.com. Well, that's where it came from. It's simply hard coded into the server. Document root, though, is important and interesting. So this is telling the web server where on the local file system the files that comprise mailinrouge.com actually live. So if you've ever used a, a shared server before, you've probably gotten used to the convention of storing all your personal website stuff in a public underscore HTML file. Well, that's very easily set up by the same config file. But when you sort of get a little more serious with websites and you have your own domain or subdomain, none of this slash tilde stuff for individual users, you can actually map your website to any directory on the local file system. And in this case, we have the fairly uh, uh, straightforward string of slash home slash username slash domains folder slash uh, domain, mailinrouge.com, slash public underscore HTML. And this is one of the upsides of using, again, a panel like cPanel, Plesk, or DirectAdmin. It is what decided on this naming convention for us. And the upside is that even though we have created for me, and in turn all of you, an individual account, you can actually host multiple domains within one account 
thanks to subdirectories, as you see here, but also thanks to virtual hosting. And it's a really convenient thing to be able to SSH into one account and have access to a whole number of domains. So it's certainly handy. What else is interesting here? Well, let me skip the SU exec for a moment. There's these custom logs. So there's different log formats that you can tinker with. And again, because the TFs and I will be administering the server for you all for the most part, you won't have to dabble in so many of these low-level details, but know that these options are available, how information is logged, where the error logs are stored. But then ultimately, this is interesting for us. So this is very specifically this block of code here setting some options or some restrictions on the particular directory that this website happens to live inside. So because we like to make things easy for students in a course like this, we're turning on all options. And we won't bore you tonight certainly in enumerating all of the options that are possible in say an Apache web server, but these are things like should the web server follow symbolic links? Or should if you just visit a, a URL that maps to a directory, not a file, should you show the user the contents of that directory? Or should you say 403 forbidden? It's things like this that constitute options that are controlled here. We just say, let them all work. Otherwise, you scratch your head wondering, why is this not working? And invariably, it's something stupid like this. But what is important for us, and in general for security, are these lines here. So SU exec user group and SU PHP engine on. So does anyone know what SU PHP is? Yeah, so super user PHP. SU is perhaps a command you've heard of or maybe used. Substitute user. It, it allows you to become another user on a system. And this has sort of become synonymous with becoming the root user, getting administrator privileges. So one of the problems that you run into on a lot of shared web hosts is that the web server itself is running under, if you know, what username? So root is useful because it means everything tends to work, but it's dangerous because if there is so much as one bug in that web server software that someone finds, some buffer overflow exploit or something else, the whole server can be compromised just because someone made the convenient but foolish decision to run this user-facing software as the root username. So more common these days, fortunately, is sorry? to run as the username nobody or the very specific username Apache. In other words, someone other than root. But there's a problem with this. This means that no matter if you have a whole bunch of users on your server, all of whom have their own websites, all of their own files and domains, well, who does their code get executed by? Well, the web server and thus by whatever that user is. So normally this might be fine if your code's getting executed by username nobody or username Apache, but what about file permissions? What does that suggest your files have to be chmodded, so to speak? And by this I mean read, write, executability, this kind of stuff if you're not familiar. Uh, so actually the opposite. So you probably want to be able to read write, but everybody else, i.e. the nobody user or the Apache user or whomever, needs to at least have read access. Sometimes executable access, but for the most part in PHP world, um, read access is possible. So if you're unfamiliar, and these are things we'll spend time on in section, um, lest we um, um, preach to the, the choir on some of these details. If you're familiar with the chmod command, on a unfortunately configured web host, but popular type of configuration, you would chmod your PHP file 644. And this means you can read and write them, and everyone can read them. Now, this is great because it means the web server can execute your code no matter what username it's running under. The problem with this is that anyone else on this shared web host that you're paying $2 a month for can also read your code, read your intellectual property, dare say. And so it's this trade off. Now, one alternative here is just run your own web server, right? And then it doesn't matter who the code's running as, because if you're the only one who can log in, this is marginally better, but that's not necessarily feasible or cost effective. So better solutions exist. And one of the solutions that exists that we are using is this module called SUPHP. This is a very easily installed package that essentially instructs Apache to run under its own username normally um, as uh, Apache or nobody or whomever. But anytime you actually execute code, for instance, PHP file, execute it as though you are 
the owner of that file. So in other words, when, if you were to pull up the task manager or run top on a Linux box, any kind of program, if you're familiar, that shows you what processes are running and who owns those processes, well, with SUPHP installed, if I implemented a website and uh, I, someone was visiting my website and some sysadmin was simultaneously monitoring what processes are running and who they're owned by, you would actually see that my index.php file is being executed by username Malin. Now the upsides of this are, are several, one of which is that if I screw up by doing something inane that completely makes vulnerable my entire account, who am I putting at risk? You know, in theory, just me. So you know, my code might get stolen, or my disk space might get filled up, or something bad might happen, but only within my environment, my mail-in account and my mail-in files. All the other users on that server, for the most part, are immune against attacks like that. But there's also some other technical upsides. If you are implementing, very reasonably, a website that lets users upload files, like photographs or something like this. If we roll back the, uh, the story here, if your web server is running as Nobody or Apache, which is you know, secure from the sysadmin's perspective, but not so secure from your IP, intellectual property perspective, what happens when a user runs your, visits your website and uploads a file that gets then saved on the local hard drive? Yeah, so now it's going to be owned by the user who created that file, which isn't the human, it's the software that was running under a username Nobody or Apache. So now you have this nuisance where all the files that your users upload, all of the Facebook photos or equivalent, are now not even owned by your username, they're owned by the Nobody username. Now, worse yet, if everyone else's code on the server is running under the same user name, and they can guess or know where your files are being saved to, well, they can go in and access them, clobber them, do anything. So you know, what started as a good thing, moving away from running server software as root to running it sort of in isolation, all of a sudden creates a lot of headaches. And fortunately, know that there are solutions out there like SUPHP, freely available. You just add it to an Apache installation that for the most part makes a lot of these headaches go away. And really, the only one your own mistakes now put at risk are yourselves. And that's actually a good thing in this case for technical and security reasons. So any questions on Apache or these configs? Yeah. In this case, yes, by direct admin. Other, but however, any human could go in and edit this file manually. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when you're saying someone could go in and destroy the files people upload, people that have access to the server or just people on the web? People that have access to the server. Because if you are, say, the student sitting next to you who also ha knows his code's running as nobody or Apache, they can simply say, delete all of the files that were uploaded by this other account. Because again, they're all owned by the same username, and thus anyone with that same power can do anything with them. So if you have your own server? In your own server, you're pretty much OK. And you can worry less about these issues. Absolutely. Other questions? Yeah. In this last line, mail and mail, does, do they both mean uh, your username or one group name? Uh, Good question. So there's this notion in Linux and in Windows of usernames and groups. By convention, direct admin just creates a Unix group for every username so that you truly have isolation in both senses. Um, it's really just um, for convenience. It could, be, it could put me, Malin, in the users group, which is also in a convention. But we don't really gain or lose anything from that. So yes, this means that the username that it runs under is Malin, and the group ID, the GID, is also Malin. So you'll get all these created for you automatically. And incidentally, after tonight, if you exit tonight thinking, whoa, this course is assuming way more than I'm coming into this for, realize, coming into this course with, just realize that for the most part, you can kind of just focus on what we'll be doing in the latter half of tonight on the PHP stuff. But hopefully, by peeling off some of these layers, you'll get a better sense of where your own code's running and how you, if you're sort of an aspiring sysadmin or just like this stuff, know how to do these things yourself. But for the most part, um, this thing here, uh, this thing here, if some of these details scare you, will be your friend this semester. OK. Other questions? No? Oh, yeah. If you have a different, if you have a second virtual host, would it open with the same tag and just have a different server name? Ah, good question. Yes. If you have another virtual host, as we do, that happens to live on the same IP at the same port, yes, you would pretty much copy and paste this lower than this in the file and then just start changing usernames and domain names. So it's not a, you don't put them inside of the virtual host tag. Good. Yeah. 
No, you don't have to specify a port. In fact, you can even replace one or I, at least one of these with an asterisk, but you can also higher up in the file specify the default port that it should listen on. And the fact that 80 is hard coded here is just a convention of direct admin, just to be very specific. It is, yeah. Yep. But you can run your website as some people do on other ports. And in fact, you'll notice that when you visit panel.cs75.net, you are actually um, redirected, thanks to an HTTP redirect, to this crazy looking thing, which is HTTPS panelcs75.net colon 2222, which is just direct admin's choice of ports, because direct admin actually comes with its own web server that's managed by it and not made available to other people. And if you want to run two different servers, they need to listen on different TCP IP sockets, which means they need to be on different ports, which means rather than make you all remember this, we just have a little PHP script that redirects you here. Yeah. Is panel like webmin? Uh, is panel like webmin? Yeah, very similar. Virtual min is the equivalent of direct admin. Virtual min is another free uh, open source product that, come, uh, that you can add on to another uh, package called webmin, which similarly sort of makes a system, administra uh, system administration more friendly. OK. All right. So what more can we do with these things? Well, a very popular goal, even simple though it is, is to make sure that your website works with just with both mailinrouge.com and www.mailinrouge.com. In fact, I did get a couple of emails from some uh, industrious students who took to heart our unofficial homework assignment last week, which, which was to find uh, at least one site out on the internet that doesn't work if you visit just foo.com as opposed to www.foo.com. Um, my promise or my suggestion to you was that you not look very hard and indeed, several of you did not, but that was a good thing because you tried to visit http colon slash slash harvard.edu and boom, doesn't actually work. So if you actually look this up, you can actually, well, why don't we um, throw this back on you? If you want to be next week's industrious student, let me suggest that your unofficial homework is to figure out why this doesn't work. Is it a DNS problem because there's no record for harvard.edu? Or is it a virtual hosting problem whereby the config file just isn't listening or didn't give a server alias for this uh, host name? See if you can tinker around with just your, your uh, live HTTP headers, maybe your command line tools like ping or nslookup, which I think I used last week, and just see if you can come up with a fun answer to that question rather than me explaining it just yet. So there's one. I'm sure there are others out there. Let's make sure that mailinrouge.com, in, in which I take a great deal of pride, actually works at both of these addresses. Lest someone visit, uh, hit a dead end, and then we lose out on some revenue stream, for instance. So if I, right now, out of the box, let me go ahead and do a little uh, Julia Child thing behind the scenes without you seeing that. And now I'm going to go to mailinrouge.com. And voila, I stay there. So it works. All right, now let me go to www.mailinrouge.com. Enter, voila, it works, and I stay there. Now, because of the people I work for who in marketing said, you know what, www is too much. Mailinrouge.com is your brand. Let's make sure that all requests ultimately get rerouted to mailinrouge.com and get rid of the www altogether, or perhaps the more popular, vice versa. Well, how can you go about doing this? Well, again, thanks to Apache and also thanks to IIS and web servers out there, you can do this with configurations. Now, IIS, as is the case with a lot of uh, Windows software, does this by way of a GUI. You click the right boxes and so forth and you can make this happen. In the Linux world and with Apache, you have to know a little more about the config files. And unfortunately, the file I'm about to edit is despite its relative simplicity, is one of the easiest things to screw up because there's a lot of things you have to bear in mind. You have to restart the web server sometimes. This is why, for instance, in the config I showed you earlier, we turned on options all. The upside of that is that we are now giving you the power to control a lot of these settings in your account without having to ask us, the sysadmins, to do it for you. So because options all is enabled for our server, for each of your virtual hosts, I can go ahead and take a snippet of code like this, these three lines, and paste them into a config file in my mailin account, in my public HTML directory, that Apache looks for any time it accesses is something in that directory, public HTML, or any of the nested subdirectories inside of there. So it will recursively check all of the subdirectories to for a file by convention called .ht access. Okay? If I then go ahead and paste this into such a file, what I get is the following. So I have now 
Actually, let me do this from step one. If you're unfamiliar with the process of SSHing or using a protocol called SSH, it's, um, it too is similar in spirit. Uh, so I'm about to fire up a free program called PuTTY, putty.exe, which I downloaded off of the web for free. Um, I am now going to tell this program that I want to connect to the server called cs75.net, though I could now use mailandrouge.com and you your own domain name. When I hit enter, this is going to open an encrypted tunnel between my laptop and that server called cs75.net, where I'm going to be prompted for my username, which in this case is going to be, oh, let me click my prefabbed option, which makes bigger fonts. I'm going to log in as Malin. It's then, a few moments later, going to prompt me for my password. And now I'm at this command line, which might be where you thrive. It might be something you run away from. But you don't have to use it in the course, but it gives you a lot of power to do so. But direct admin will also sort of simplify things so that you can use a GUI instead of the command line. But I'm going to go ahead and type ls. And you'll notice that, much like your accounts, we have by default a domains directory and a public HTML. Now, if I said earlier you can actually host multiple domains and those are stored in the domain subdirectory, what's with this sort of more important looking public HTML directory? Well, the convention that Direct Admin takes that other products do as well is if you go into domains, there's mailinrouge.com. If I now go into mailinrouge.com, just using the CD, change directory command, here's apparently some stuff related to my domain name. But if I actually, oh, you know, I just painted myself into a corner. So on a real student's account, public HTML would actually be a symbolic link to the domain. Uh, the, let's see if I can fix this. So what your accounts are going to look like is, oh, who owns that? Ah, damn it. All right, so teacher sort of took control of the server as root and changed some things around at one point. Um, so your accounts will actually have public HTML being a symbolic link, sort of an alias, to your default domain subdirectory. So that's why both of these things exist. This will become relevant only insofar as you end up, if you decide to host multiple domains within your account or slightly uh, if you host multiple subdomains, as you will in the future. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and go into my public HTML directory, which most of you probably know is by convention where files tend to live on a web server. In here, I have uh, apparently prefabbed an index.html file and a mailinrouge.jpg file. But now I'm going to go ahead and do an ls-a, which shows me all files. And sure enough, there's another file in here called .htaccess. Well, in fact, slight white lie, I renamed it with a period just to disable it effectively. Now it's called .htaccess. And here are the contents. So I'm using VI or Vim. It's just a text editor. You could use Emacs, uh, uh, Nano, Pico, or any of those things. Or download it locally and use Notepad or equivalent. Notice I have those same three lines of code. One, I'm telling the web server, turn on your rewrite engine. The rewrite engine is actually a hugely powerful thing. And as you start administering more complicated websites and for at, perhaps reorganize your website, but you don't want to give people a lot of dead end links, I mean, there's some great power with these files whereby you can bounce people from one URL URL to another. And that's, in fact, exactly what I'm doing. Because in these two lines, I'm effectively telling the server the following. Here comes a rewrite condition. Check the value of this variable. Now, how do I know this variable exists? I read the Apache documentation at this URL here. And I simply found the variable that whose value I want to check. And the, val the variable I want to check is the HTTP host, aka the fully qualified domain name that came in on the URL. All right, what do I want to check? I want to check if it's not the case, so bang typically denotes the opposite, not. It's not the case that HTTP host equals this string. Now this, if you're familiar with regular expressions, means start matching at the start of the string. And this means stop ending at the end of the string. So this means literally HTTP host has got to not equal www.mailinrouge.com. NC, a little trivia, any guess as to what that means? Uh, not close, no case. So be case insensitive, which is good because DNS itself is case insensitive. So if that condition is true, that is the request that's come in does not have an HTTP host of www.mailinrouge.com, what do I want to do? I want to make it have an HTTP host of www.mailinrouge.com. And so the rule I'm giving is the following. Go ahead now, and here's another little regular expression, match everything in the path of the URL. So everything after the first real forward slash, 
grab all of that, store it in a variable called dollar sign one by convention. That's what the parens mean. Put this in a variable called dollar sign one and rewrite the user's URL as this HTTP colon slash slash mailinroot.com slash dollar sign one. So take what was there, paste it onto the end of this partial URL. And any guess as to what this is referring to? The R equals 301. Uh, not request, uh, it's a code, not redirect, it's the response code. So we rattled off a few of these last week. 200 is great, means everything worked. 404, bad, file not found. 403, forbidden. 301 means page has moved. And so this code is telling the browser, take this URL and go to it instead because the URL you requested really doesn't want to serve you at this address anymore. Now the comma L means this is the last rule. So you can actually have multiple rewrite condition rule, condition rule, condition rule. L just means that's it for this block of conditions and rules. So you can stagger these things in the file. So in the end, we're saying if you've got a request that's come in on this particular subdirectory, public HTML, but the domain name is not www.mailinrouge.com, it's something else go ahead and make it be www.mailinrouge.com. So if I save this file, I go back to my browser and pull up, uh, let's go to mailinrouge.com, enter. Notice, sorry, that was browser caching. Notice if you actually hit reload and force it to make a new request, I did get redirected to mailinrouge.com. Let's make it even more clear. I'm going to go ahead and clear private data. Another habit, frankly, in this course that's good to get into, Anytime you actually think you know more than the computer and something else is broken, odds are it's some stupid caching issue. Just clear the cache and see if that gets rid of it. So HTTP colon slash slash mailinrouge.com, enter. And indeed, it goes ahead and adds in the dub dub dub. So what's the upside of this? Right, let's ask the who cares question. Why is this a useful or good thing? OK, branding. I mean, that's a lot of it. A lot of websites do this just because. OK, why else is this good? Searching, so sort of normalize or making, coming up with canonical URLs that you want to appear in search results, so related in spirit to branding, but also search engines like Google do respect these, these response codes. So for a while, we've even made mistakes in the past where we ended up getting a really ugly URL cached in Google search results because we were playing, or I was playing, or I'll fess up, I was playing around with the HD access file, didn't really think about the implications of temporarily redirecting the whole internet to another domain, and sure enough, within a couple weeks, Google had now assumed that this funky looking URL was now our home page, which was an accident. It took a few weeks for that to go away. So search results, certainly relevant. What's a downside of being so focused on your brand or whatever that you take this approach? What's that? Yeah, it's an extra request. So if people are typing in mailinrouge.com a lot and hitting enter, well, you're getting hit twice as many times. Now, fortunately, the first request doesn't require a lot of bandwidth because all that's going back are the headers, presumably not images and content. But still, it's an extra request, which might not be in your best interests. Then again, we can take a lesson from some of the big folks out there. Like, let's see what Google does. Google.com. Well, they do it, so if they can do it, I mean, maybe we can get away with the extra hit, right? Sort of in, in rule of uh, just infer by example. Yeah? So it's, it's, so it's a very good tie-in, actually. So the question that I didn't pose is how in the world would you get here from some URL other than www.mailinrouge.com. Well, because we began our story by in, uh, including A records for both domain names, mailinrouge.com and www.mailinrouge.com, that means the internet will direct traffic to either of those uh, host names to the same destination, which means there are multiple different ways in which you can end up requesting index.html in this particular subdirectory, no matter where you are on the internet. So it's only this HT access file that is sort of the stopgap at the very last point that can say, OK, wait a minute. I don't care how you got here, thanks to DNS. Now let me make sure you go and uh, take the path that I want you to take if the DNS records did not work. So there, th therein lies a hint with the harvard.edu example. Is it just that we're not listening on the right host name, or maybe is it just not resolving? It could be one or both of those things. Yeah? So in the case of the Harvard, um, so they don't have it set up properly, wouldn't you be able to, if you were really crafty, redirect someone away from Harvard's actual website if you, if you, if you supported um, Harvard without the www? 
So it's a good question. Could you exploit this reality with like harvard.edu and resolve all requests to harvard.edu to some random inappropriate website, for instance? So short answer, it depends. So scary answer, yes. But short answer, it depends on exactly what kind of control you have here. So those who've been sort of following along closely here, how could we take advantage of this, perhaps? Or who could take advantage of this reality if we assume for a moment that the problem is DNS and not Apache related? OK, criminals, be more specific. <laughs> Hack, OK, more specific. But who, like who, who could technically pull this off? OK, so someone like a GoDaddy, someone who actually is interposed between me and the rest of the internet. Now, GoDaddy, at least at the moment, if we, it, let's assume for the moment that Harvard probably has its own DNS servers, but they did buy their domain name at some point from someone, even if it was, uh, even if it was for a, you know, a penny back in the day. So someone is probably between their DNS servers and the rest of the world, even if it's just uh, network solutions, sort of the biggest fish. Well, they could certainly take it upon themselves to screw with the records here. But the problem is, at least there, is if Harvard's managing its DNS servers, the only ones who can add A records and add C name records are in this case, Harvard's DNS server. So you could have a criminal, a hacker, a disgruntled employee within Harvard just start bouncing traffic elsewhere. But what else, who else has this power? Maybe not in between Harvard and, say, their registrar. You can kind of do it on the other side, too, couldn't you? So good. So the ISP could certainly do this. Or really, anyone who has control over DNS servers that your little old laptop might be communicating with, whether it's the Marriott Hotel that you happen to be staying at, whether it's Comcast DNS server that you happen to be using, whether it's Starbucks and you're using their AT&T hotspot. Right? So anyone who has control over DNS responses could be screwing with you, even if they're not the authoritative source for IP mappings for that particular domain name. So there's been a few ISPs, I think, even in this country that have gotten into some hot water, at least in the press, because they've taken it upon themselves if a, one of their you know, uh, home users, you know, mom and dad at home, accidentally makes a typo and tries to pull up foo.com. And foo.com doesn't exist. Moreover, it does, it's not even owned by someone. Well, what at least one ISP, whose name I forget, has done is they are using their DNS servers to redirect that home user to a nice big advertising page where they can buy some products products that they make some revenue off of. And this was kind of a big deal, at least for the, you know, the people on Slashdot who were ranting about this on that particular day, just because a lot of users wouldn't realize what's going on, certainly. And also, that's at least not the way things typically work. But in short, anyone who's in between you and the requests you're making, e.g. DNS requests, can certainly play around with that. Yeah? The Belkin routers did that for a period of time. Really? They would Interesting. So Belkin home routers apparently also took it upon themselves to bounce you elsewhere if a DNS query simply did not resolve. So short answer is it depends on exactly what technical access you have here. Good questions. Other questions? No? So this is just a scratching the, um, uh, the, this is just a tip of the iceberg with what you can do with these configuration files. So we in CS75 actually play around with our URLs a lot because we're often moving things around. We like to give very easy URLs for students to remember sometimes. For instance, uh, when we ultimately put content videos and such on iTunes, it's just nice to actually have students be able to visit cf75.net slash iTunes. And it bounces not to our site, but to apple.com. And you can do that similarly with these rewrite rules. An alternative, just to be clear, and this will be a little teaser for some other things you can do with PHP. If I wanted mailinrouge.com slash foo to go elsewhere, well, how could I do that? Well, sort of back in the day, or sort of the poor man's approach to this, would be to make a real subdirectory called foo, chmod it so that it's world ex openable. Uh, let me go into foo. And now what I could do is, one, I could do an index.html, and I can do this like meta refresh tag whose syntax I never forget. So you can just sort of do it browser style. And uh, I defer to Google on the specific syntax there. A little more memorable for me is I can write a quick PHP script that very simply does this. Uh, location, HTTP, how about google.com? OK, uh-huh, uh uh-huh. 
OK, so this is the shortest of all possible PHP scripts that we'll perhaps see today. Sort of a fancier version of Hello World, but that's a PHP script. Notice that I can go ahead and leave it shamoded 600. I don't need this on our server because, again, you own your files and they'll get executed by you. So the defaults are OK. But now if I did this correctly, let's try this out. So let me close Google. Let me go back here. Go to HTTP colon slash slash mailinrouge.com slash foo. And indeed, it works. But there's uh, arguably bad design here if I'm creating a subdirectory and a file just to do something I can do with the one line or two lines of a config. So that's the kind of stuff you can do. And it, it's quite powerful. Other questions? Yeah. All right, so a quick teaser here. XAMPP is something we alluded to last week. And despite everything I just said, where you're going to get an account on this fancy thing called CS75.net and you can run your code on it, odds are many of you, if you're like last year's students, are going to want to just develop locally because you're more comfortable there, because you have faster connections, because you can develop your sites offline. And that's fine. All we expect is that your work ultimately work on CS75.net, which if properly implemented should fairly uh, seamlessly and be submitted electronically on the course's server. But a very popular option last year for the course's students was to download this free package, XAMPP, uh, with the X stands for all of those different operating systems that are supported, which is great, uh, Apache, MySQL, uh, PHP, and also Perl. So some people add a second P. To, or there is a second P. We don't care about it in this course. But what this essentially is is a really nice bundle that you download as like a Mac image or as a big uh, zip file that you just extract your hard drive. And literally within minutes, you have all of this software up and running, in addition to some other tools, one of them called PHP MyAdmin, which is a really nice GUI for administering a MySQL database, which we'll also make use of in the course. So if there are alternatives to this, and Googling XAMPP alternatives will probably lead you their way, we found this to be one of the most user-friendly options out there. And thanks to a former teaching fellow, if you go to our software page, which I did update since last week to have the very latest links for all the stuff we like to discuss, he whipped up this how to install XAMPP, which is a wonderful, um, he has a thing for squirrels. Uh, it's a wonderful little how to on getting yourself up and running. So if you're bored tonight or you're just really eager tonight or tomorrow, probably five, ten minutes, you'll have all this up and running, especially if you follow his directions. Yep. I followed that and uh -oh. the only thing that I found odd was this to go into uh, version. <laughs> Oh, is that just outdated now? Oh, OK. So I will ask him to uh, update his source, assuming the directions haven't changed. But I'm guessing that's a small enough change version-wise that that will still work. So it might take you more than 10 minutes. Apparently, it'll take you up through the next lecture. But we'll, we'll take care of that. Thanks for the heads up. OK, let's take a five-minute break. And I'll field any individual questions you might have. All right, we are back, and it's time to learn PHP. So let me qualify this claim, too. So the course, as we said last week, does assume that folks are coming into the course with some form of programming background. You know what a loop is. You know what a function is. You maybe even know what a hash table and such are. But for the most part, we're not going to spend time holding hands in terms of here is how you write a for loop in PHP. Because odds are, it's going to look terribly similar, boringly similar to what it looks like in most any other language that you're coming at. So for the most part, my goals with lectures with the language of PHP is going to introduce one sort of the conceptual underpinnings of it so that you understand um, what features the language has, how to access those features, but not necessarily where individual semicolons go, for instance, because I think the chat would very quickly devolve into something boring. But certainly raise your hand at any point if you have questions about the language. But what's wonderful, frankly, about PHP, certainly from a course's perspective, is just how easy it is to bootstrap yourself to knowing this language. And that's in no small part because of the wonderful documentation that exists for this language in the form of php.net. So a very common resource for you this semester will be not only Google, which odds are will lead you to php.net, but also the manual on php.net itself. So this website, if not already visually familiar, is right here. There's a whole lot of information you'll never need to access here. But know that from this website can you download PHP itself. We'll talk about what that means to download PHP in just a moment. But you can also access the online documentation. So this little search bar at top right will certainly be your friend. So for instance, if you want to know how to count the number of elements in an array, well, it's probably something like count. And in fact, 
It is. And so this is sort of a standard view of documentation. The documentation standardized much like Javadoc is for Java. What you'll see on the left hand side always is related functions to whatever you're looking at, which is useful because even I often remember that the function exists but have no recollection of the name. But it kind of reminds you visually. And then you'll see this standard. So you'll see the function signature, that is, uh, its return value and its parameters. We'll talk a little bit about what can go inside those parentheses, what mixed means as a data type here. You'll then see a nice human readable description. You'll see if the function exists in PHP and or uh, 4 and or 5. We teach 5 in the course. 5 has some wonderful features. It's uh, actually object oriented, but a lot of web hosts these days are still kind of clinging to PHP 4, though that's decreasingly the case. But just realize it because next week, uh, in two and three weeks, we'll be focusing on XML and some XML specific features of PHP and some of those only exist in the latest version which fortunately has been out for some time now but just buyer beware if you're signing up for some web host make sure you read the fine print as to what version of the language they support. Well below this you'll see a specification for what the parameters are and it spells it out. You'll see what the return values are for this function. Again odds are for the count function the return value is going to be an integer telling you the number of elements in the array. But then what's wonderful about this documentation is it actually has examples. And this even distinguishes it from typical Javadoc documentation. You'll see usage examples like this that are nicely syntax highlighted, numbered, uh, explains what the example is doing. And then it even goes so far as to include one, links to related functions, usually useful. But then there's also. Um, um, uh, threads of discussion that go on related to this function, which is not typically a place you need to spend much time. But often, if you're trying to solve some interesting problem or you actually stumble across a need for a feature that doesn't exist in PHP, some really nice folks will often post some implementations of their own functions within these threads that might very well be worth copying, pasting, and citing within your own code, because it solves exactly what you're trying to solve. So it, too, is a wonderful thing as well. So take great comfort in knowing that PHP is, I think, a very easy language to pick up. Certainly if you're coming from a world that's syntactically similar, which most any high level uh, procedural language is these days, um, or imperative languages these days. And so I don't think uh, it'll be too scary of a world to dive into. So I said a moment ago that you can download PHP. And yet we're going to be writing PHP in this class. So what does that actually mean? Well, unlike a language like C or C++, that's a compiled language, whereby you write source code with a simple text editor. You then run it through GCC or Visual Studio. And you actually get out a .exe file or equivalent, zeros and ones, object code, in other words. With PHP, you're writing in an interpreted language. And this means, in theory, that it's not as high performing as something like C or C++. And that does tend to be the case, at least for uh, computationally interesting problems. But certainly for the rendering of web content, for retrieving data from databases, um, it's it works great. And there are even add-ons that we'll talk about later in the course in the context of scalability that allow you to implement caching into your web server so that you're not regenerating the same darn page again and again, even though the content itself hasn't changed. We'll talk about memcached, a popular free tool that allows you to cache output. Facebook, for instance, uses this to decrease the load on their databases and some other tricks as well. But an interpreted language means that when a user pulls up your uh, website and goes to foo.php, that's simply a text file, as we've already seen with the quick one I whipped up, that has some PHP code in it. All PHP code, it turns out, as you may have inferred, begins with a tag that looks like this, open bracket, question mark, PHP, and then ends with question mark, angled bracket. But you can have any number of white spaces in between these things. So very often, this will be at the top of the file, and this will be at the bottom of the file. And many of you might already be reacting to this as, Ooh, this is not the PHP I know. If you tweak your PHP configuration on your server accordingly, you can even get by without writing PHP as well, which is a little prettier, but your code is less portable. Because if you try writing code that has support for this enabled, then you move it to a server that doesn't have support for these short tags, so to speak, then you have to go through and find and replace all of these things, which is a minor headache, if nothing else. But know that both exist. I tend to write this just because it looks prettier, and I don't like seeing PHP all throughout my code. But with that said, an interpreted language, just PHP, means when the browser pulls up foo.php, 
It's got some stuff like this in there. It might have some lines of actual code, print out, printfs, and echo statements and things like that. Well, what's going to happen? Well, the web server gets the request for foo.php and like any other file. But we or you have configured your server in such a way that has taught the web server that any file ending in .php should not be served up as static content, like an HTML page or a .gif or a .jpeg, but rather should be handed off to a program on the local server. That program is something like php.exe or slash user slash bin slash php. So it's an actual program on the hard drive on the server that is then passed this file, this text file is input. It then reads it top to bottom, left to right, and effectively converts all of the lines of code in, in it to the equivalent of zeros and ones, which are then executed by this CPU. Some stuff, presumably HTML and other content, is spit out. And it's the output of this program called PHP that's actually handed by Apache or IIS back to the user's browser. So it's sort of the middleman. It's, the it's not an application server, per se, but it is the application that executes your files um, inside of whatever uh, server your code is running. So as a result, it's an interpreted language, which means it won't run as fast for our purposes and really not going to be an issue. But it does mean you don't have to recompile your code. You make one change, you reload the file in your browser, and voila, you'll see the results for better or for worse. Um, it does mean that debugging your code is, um, well, actually, Unrelated to that, debugging PHP code is not necessarily as easy as you might like because you're typically interfacing with the uh, code you've written from a uh, destination that's completely remote. So a browser talking to a remote server, but there are tricks. We've installed some modules into the server, CS75.net, so that if you do make a mistake, whether minor or major, your page will spit out some additional debugging information that tells you what line number you probably screwed up on and probably what the error is. And there are some other client-side tools as well that you might want to, that you're free to dabble in um, when uh, working on your own sites. So with that said, Let's actually do something with this language. So if you've made a web page before, you might very well have used this code before. Certainly if you have visited a web page like Google, you have interacted with an HTML or an XHTML form. And for the most part, at least initially in this course, it is via forms that you will provide your programs, your dynamic websites with actual input from users. So let's take a canonical example here. So Google.com is actually, all these years later, wonderfully simple still, except for a few days ago when it broke completely, if you uh, follow the news. But I'm going to go ahead and view the page source. Notice that there's some funky looking stuff in here that probably looks a little like JavaScript to some of you, if you know the language. Um, but notice that it's been minified. So um, perhaps for intellectual property reasons, though it's hard to claim much intellectual property behind the Google homepage, um, more likely for bandwidth reasons and for cost reasons, they have quote unquote minified or minimized the amount of space that their homepage takes up. Now, one, it's now a mess to look at. But why is it probably a good thing that this thing is now so just compacted together? It's not compressed in the like gzip sense, but it's like compressed aesthetically. Yeah, it's transfer speed, right? It's a smaller file. Like it might be nice for the human who wrote the code to see nice tabs and line breaks and whatnot. But you know, when you then serve up the same page a billion times a day, you don't really need to pay for the billions of additional bytes you're sending across the wire, as Google, I'm sure, is. Moreover, it's just a waste of time if a browser is going to be interpreting this stuff anyway. But I'm going to go ahead and nonetheless, and I'm going to copy this. Uh, let me go ahead and open up my own text editor for a moment. OK, so I'm going to turn on line wrap just so that, OK, now it's really a mess. But hopefully, we'll see some familiar things in here. So it's a little small at the moment, but that's OK. But notice there's this thing up here, doc type. It's not even uh, sort of a compliant doc type per se, but apparently it presumably works on pretty much everyone's computer on the internet if they're getting away with it. But what I'm going to do is a search for the form tag. So all the way down here is apparently a form tag. I'm going to assume now that none of this stuff is enlightening for us today. Um, let me go ahead and now search for, take a guess. Yeah, the close form tag. There it is. Let's get rid of that. So now this is sort of Google, you know, even just two years ago, three years ago, before they had all the, this uh, like iGoogle stuff at the top, which is adding some of this complexity. All right, so now I'm in my text editor here. Now notice Google, despite what some um, 
uh, fanatics might claim um, using tables to lay things out is perhaps a sin. They still do it as well. Um, we'll use it in part just because it's simple, but let's see if we can tear away some of this mess. So table is just aesthetic here. I really don't care about this. Okay, here's something interesting. Maybe I don't know what it is yet, but now I've left an input element. Let me continue pruning. All right, another input element that looks useful. Google search, that's already familiar. A line break, okay, let me, let me start separating this out a little bit so it's a little easier to read. Line break, uh, button G, Google search, interesting. Another input, I'm feeling lucky, that sounds familiar. Okay, and now we got some CSS, we got a link which I don't care about. Uh, preferences which I don't care about, you know, I think that'll do it for us. Let's get rid of this rest of the table. And there is Google in its essence, right? Billions of dollars a year, and that's really all the front end to this website is. All of the rest is just an evolution of what is still today a very simple web page. So let's consider what this is actually doing and how we can perhaps ourselves take advantage of this. So when you send an HTTP request across the wire, it typically looks like this very simple thing that we've seen a few times now. So it looks like the word GET in all caps. Uh, forward slash in the case of getting the default home page, or more specifically, something like index.html. And then what, what came after this? Yeah, it was just the version number, right? Humans don't really need to care about this, but you'll start seeing this more and more, so it'll get easier to remember. So that's a simple HTTP request. Now, probably there's a host colon field after this and some other stuff, but for the most part, that is, or rather before this, that is the HTTP request that's going across the wire. But it turns out that you can embed more than just a simple request for a file name. You can actually embed parameters, query parameters. So in fact, if I'm not implementing my simple static website of of called index.html, but instead Google, I'm instead going to send a request to maybe a program or a directory, it seems, called search. And I'm inferring from what Google did here. But then anything after a question mark in the path that you're providing in this HTTP header goes in as an actual parameter. So Q equals foo, then HTTP slash 1.1 or 1.0. This means you're still requesting a URL of the form google.com slash search, but then the question mark says here comes a bunch of parameters, as they're called, or variables you can think of them as, that are name value pairs. Name equals value, name equals value, name equals value, and in between each pair is what symbol? is the ampersand symbol. So question mark means everything before this denotes the path that's being requested. Everything after this denotes the, que uh, denotes the uh, query string, the set of parameters that are being passed in, if anything. And each of those or parameter value pairs is separated by convention with an ampersand. All right. So why is this useful? Well, let's see. What's hap actually happening with this example here? How can I induce a request like this to be made? Well, you can induce a request like this to be made in a couple of different ways. Let me go ahead and open, just so I can quickly adjust the font. Another wonderful uh, teaching tool, WordPad. It's the only use I've ever had for this program. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and say a href equals uh, search, question mark, q equals foo. OK, click me. OK, this, a very simple hyperlink with which you're all pr presumably quite familiar. If I click that link, what kind of query goes across the wire by default? This is an HTTP GET request. So if I click that link, what is literally sent across the wire, in addition to all those messy headers, is this. So this is sort of the default behavior of a web request. So contrast this with another type of HTTP request, that of POST, P-O-S-T. It turns out, and as you might imagine, you can only cram so much information into one line of code like this. You can only cram so much information after a question mark. Imagine after all visiting Facebook and then somehow one, encoding your latest photo as um, something uh, textual like Base64. You could sure put that after this, but my god, the URL is just going to be gargantuan. And there's no, unfortunately, formal limit on how big URLs can be. Browsers, in fact, differ on their very specifications. But a safe rule of thumb is like, if your URLs are more than 1,024 characters, you're really pushing the odds that it's going to work in all browsers. And even that is probably excessively large. Right? Just imagine pasting that into an email. I mean, you've all experienced it, or people you've sent mail to have all said, sorry, that link didn't work, just because some stupid thing like it wrapped onto the other line. So there's also some 
some UI concerns with the URLs that long. So there exists an alternative to get, which is post, which actually sends the information in pretty much the same way, but not in the HTTP headers. It puts it in what's called the body of the HTTP request. So instead of, in short, above all the headers, it puts it below all of the headers, conceptually the upside being now it can be as long as you want it to be because you're not waiting and waiting and waiting to actually get to the headers and seeing what those headers are. So that's, there's more important differences than that. But for now, know that a simple link like this induces a get. For a post, you actually need a form. But you can actually use a form to induce a get. In fact, I can recreate the same effect almost by saying this, form. And then action is where the destination of this request is. So search, I'm just going to leave it at that. Method is going to be get. In XHTML, even though the, browser, the protocol says caps, the DTD, so to speak, the spec for XHTML says lowercase. So it's got to be lowercase to be valid. You can have an input type equals hidden. But I can give this input a name of Q. And I can give it a value of foo. And now I can go ahead and say input type equals submit, value equals uh, fake query. Right? And then I can close this form tag. And when I actually click this button that's going to be called fake query in this case, the request that's going to go across the wire is exactly this. So both that form and that link create the same exact request. Now let's see if we can't exploit this then. Let me go ahead now to Malin Rouge and actually do something useful with it. Let me get rid of that silly foo directory. Here's my file. I'm going to go ahead and create a file called google.html. Unfortunately, even though I, we preach being XHTML compliant, I never remember the doc type. So what I'm actually going to do is copy my current index, call it google.html. I'm going to make sure it's world readable. I'm now going to go in here. Uh, I'm now going to go in here. This, frankly, is the string I never remember. So now I'm going to go in here. We're going to call this fake Google. I'm going to go ahead and leave the body. Well, let's get rid of this. Just let it default to white. Let me go in here. And now I'm going to have a quick test. So hello world. Let's make sure this page is working, google.html. So let me pull up my browser here, mailinrouge.com slash google.html. OK, it's coming along. And in fact, the URL even redirected per that htaccess file. So at least that's working as, as planned. All right, so now let's actually put a link in here. So uh, a href equals uh, slash search, question mark query equals foo, click me. So now I've recreated that. I'm going to go ahead and reload. And now if I click this, unfortunately, what's the problem? Right. I don't have a directory. I don't have a file. I don't have anything called slash search. OK, so I actually am taking some liberties. Maybe for now, I'm going to save myself some trouble and not implement all of Google, but instead just do part of it. I'll go ahead and even make them happy with the dub, dub, dub. Now let's save that, reload, click this link. Ah, I just searched for foo. And up comes Wikipedia for foo bar. All right, so good. I've kind of recreated Google already, but it's not that useful. It's not that dynamic because it only searches for foo, not the most useful website. So let's enhance this. Let's rip that out. Let's go ahead and do form action equals now that same URL. So www.google.com google.com slash search. Uh, method, I'll just do get because I'm pretty comfortable with that now. Close my form. Uh, I could go the hidden approach, but um, well, let's do that first. Sure. Equals type equals hidden, name equals Q, value equals foo. And now I'm going to do input type equals submit, and value equals fake Google search. And I'll post these um, source code files on the lectures page of the website, so you don't need to scribble all of this down. Let me reload. All right, so marginally more aesthetically interesting, but still just as useless. All right, so now let's make it a little more dynamic. But notice, let's actually reinforce the utility of this tool, live HTTP headers. Let me clear the buffer, click fake Google search, and now scroll up here. And in fact, notice that in f that is in fact the query that we promised would go across the wire. So it seems to be working. Let's make it a little more dynamic now. So let me go back to my code. Let's change this from a hidden field to a text field. And again, if, this is fe if these are features of HTML, XHTML that you're not familiar with, just read a quick web page this weekend. Read the recommended reading on Project Zero and bring yourself up to speed. Not complicated stuff. Let me get rid of the default value. 
And now, at least, we'll have something a little more reminiscent of Google. Still pretty ugly, but you know what? Let's make it even slightly more reminiscent of Google. OK, getting there, how about a div uh, align equals center? All right, if we really want to be anal. OK, it's getting there. Oh, maybe I should do a little something like this, H1, uh, H1 fake Google. Oops, that was, there we go. OK, not bad, right? So for five minutes time. All right, so now let's try searching for foo, fake Google search. OK, so it works. Now let's try searching for bar, probably get a different kind of bar. Oh, bar unit, interesting. OK, so it seems to be working. And in fact, if I pull up the HTTP headers and I search this time for baz, in fact, I will see the different queries going across the wire. And the very first one, in fact, is exactly this query. So here we have, in this sheer simplicity, this really powerful foundation for just interacting with a website and providing inputs. And you know that there are things like checkboxes and radio buttons and select menus, all of which are probably familiar with you functionally, if not code-wise, because you can do a whole bunch of things such as those things enumerated here. But let's try messing with Google just a little bit. Let me go ahead and say, you know what? Um, I don't like one thing here. What is interesting about the URL that I've hit? Or what's worth noting? I've just typed something into my search page, hit Enter, and where is that information revealed? Yeah, so it's in the location bar, which is useful in the interest of copying and pasting, emailing this link of results to friends. So there's definitely some utility there. But now imagine that I'm not just implementing fake Google. I'm implementing the login mechanism to my website. What's the, the obvious or non-obvious problem here? Right, you're going to show their username and their password. Now, maybe that's OK, because I'm the only one using this computer right now. But we all know probably that you type stuff into your address bar, you hit URLs, and where does it end up also? The cache, right? It ends up probably multiple places on disk. You have to clear the buffer. I mean, it's just you leave a lot of trails when you sit down at a typical browser. Yeah. Ah, good question. So let's actually mess around with this. What if I made it a password field? Does that avoid it? Well, let me go ahead and just change even my query string to a pa of type password, just so that I get little bullet signs instead of actual strings. Now let me type in this. All right, secret query. Let's hope it's uh, age appropriate. Here, and here we are, CSE75. And it did, in fact, go across the wire. So it's entirely the method that governs how the information is sent from browser to server. The password thing is the bullet sign is purely a client side aesthetic detail. In fact, if you had a keystroke sniffer, it would certainly log everything. Um, it's just an aesthetic detail. But it's a good thought. But let's see if we can work around this by using this other method called post. So let me roll back to our non password version. Post, I know, is useful if only because it hides the contents. It doesn't put it in the URL. Rather, it sends it in the body of the request, much like a response comes back not in the URL, but in some sort of unseen part of the body of that response. So now let me change this to post. Let me go ahead and reload the page, because I've really changed the code now. Now let me go ahead and type in uh, Harvard Computer Science E75, Enter. Interesting. So Google, this is not common, has just turned off support altogether for post, presumably because they don't want to encourage people to bang on their servers with really large requests. Um, though most servers would actually have this enabled. And incidentally, if you really want to go on a tangent, uh, Google font, I think we could really mess around here and type in fake. This is where you can, this part is not at all instructionally useful, but. <laughs> If I go ahead and type, call this logo.gif, actually I can, I can kind of angle here, say here's how you use SFTP with CS75.net. So I've created a GIF online. I'm going to go ahead to my desktop, and there it is on my desktop. You can use any number of clients. There are free ones available. On our course's website, we also provide you with um, uh, secure FX, which Harvard has a site license for, which is pretty user friendly. CS75, uh, nope, Malin is the account I want to log into. I'm going to log in here. You just get a GUI structure for the domains and such that you own. I'm going to go in here. Aha, uh -huh. now let me go to logo.gif. It's a drag and drop thing. 
I've dragged it in. I'm going to right click on logo.gif and check properties because I need to make sure it's world readable. If you're not familiar with Chmod, another at home exercise can be to Google Chmod, C H M O D. 644, like I said before, which unintentional rhyme, just um, means make it world readable. I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. I'm now going to go back to my code and my fake Google site. I'm now going to replace this header tag with something along the lines of logo.gif. So again, sort of HTML 101 here, but we now have a more compelling lecture example. <laughs> All right, so not bad for 10 minutes now of work. So let's now actually, you know, accept that this this thing kind of sucks, right? I didn't really do anything other than redirect yet more revenue to Google's website. So what can we actually do on our end? And this is where we begin to get into the power of a language like PHP or most any uh, server side. Uh, web-oriented language. So with PHP, can we now take over the task of receiving these incoming requests? We can change our form. We can change our links, not to point to google.com slash search, but to you know, mailandrouge.com slash search, or maybe more specifically, slash search.php, just to be even more clear that we're now coding in PHP. And I can pass into my search.php file all of the arguments that I was once passing to Google. So a little teaser here might be this. Let me go ahead into my uh, same directory. I'm going to create a file called search.php. The .php is not strictly necessary. You can tweak your Apache or IIS config to use other extensions or none at all. But this is certainly the convention. It's the only way our server is configured, so partly for security purposes. I'm going to be anal for now and always put the PHP, just because people like to encourage that behavior. And now I'm going to indent just to be nice here. But all I'm going to do is the following. First, I'm going to say, you know what? Let's keep it really simple. Print hello world. Whoops, hello world. Okay, and that's it for my current PHP file. So search.php has been saved. Notice that I've not shamoded it because it's only need only be owned by me. So I'm going to go now to mailandrouge.com, search.php. And okay, so baby steps. We now have a working piece of code that's not redirecting me like my first version of this. It's keeping me here. Now this, if I view the page's source, really is not a web page, right? It's just some ASCII text. So I'm kind of cutting corners here. So you know what? Let me back up. Let me go ahead and do the following. I'm going to copy again, let's say google.html. I'm going to call it search.php, but only because I'm going to gut some of it now. So now I have a new version of search.php, which isn't even PHP. It's just HTML. But that's OK, because you know what? I'm going to go ahead and rip out everything between the body tag. And I'm just going to write literally, hello world here. But I'm going to claim this is now a PHP program. It's not a dynamic website, but it is a website written in PHP. Just so happens there's no PHP in the file called search.php, but it's going to work. So let me go ahead and reload now. It's still the same, but if I view the page source, notice that there's a whole lot of boring H uh, XHTML. So let me be a little more dynamic, though just as unimpressive. PHP, close this tag here, indent just to be nice and pretty. <laughs> And let me go ahead and do print hello world. All right, so we're really not increasing your skill set here just yet, because that creates the same result. Maybe the white space is a little different now, but the effect is the same. And you'll realize, too, in the matter, uh, I said last week that, um, or actually the syllabus states that projects will be graded along three main axes, correctness, design, style. We care more in this course about the beauty of the actual code you're writing, not so much what the browser's seeing coming out. So like this. Detail is not something you need to stress over trying to get your output white space to be pretty. Clearly, as we saw from Google, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, certainly on the browser end. So now let's do something a little more interesting. You know what? I remember vaguely a while ago uh, that uh, uh, if I submit information to this page, I can print out that same information. So let me go ahead and do this. I know that I'm going to receive a parameter called Q. And I just want to print out what Q is if it comes in on the wire. So let me do this. So um, uh, your query was colon. And now, oops, this is not PHP. Let's do it this way. So that's raw text. Let me put this all in one line. Uh, so I can. So I'm going to use, oh, so I could use it there, actually. So let's do this. Yep, this will be simpler at first. So PHP, I'm going back to where I was. So yes, print. Let me go ahead and print out your query was. 
And now I'm going to do this. So dot is the concatenation operator in PHP, much like plus in Java or JavaScript. Dot is concatenation. What am I going to concatenate? Well, it turns out that there's a special variable in PHP. And all variables, henceforth, know that they start with a dollar sign. It's called underscore get. It's an array, aka uh, um, associative array, such that if I put in square brackets and in quotes the name of the element in this array I want to get, that's what's going to come back to me. So I know this thing's going to be called Q. So I very simply, I'm going to do this. Print out, quote unquote, your query was colon space dot, and then whatever is in the get array at the Q location. So know now, if you don't, that arrays don't have to be indexed with numbers 0, 1, 2, 3. They can be associative arrays, whereby you can have words or arbitrary numbers mapping to values. In this sense, are they just hash tables? If you're familiar with that, key value pairs. So now, let's do this. Let me go into my google.html. Let me decommission the Google version of this, but instead submit to http colon slash slash www.mailinrouge.com slash search dot php. But let me change my method back to get, just to infer what the goal here is, and now save it. All right, I'm going to go back to my browser. And again, I'll make all this code available online. Google.html still looks the same, but a quick sanity check of the source code, and again, constantly refresh when coding this stuff, is now notice the destination is, in fact, mailinrouge.com. So now I'm going to go ahead and type in something random, fake Google search, and OK. So now I arguably have pretty bad, but a nonetheless dynamic website, because now it's changing based on the inputs that are coming in. And what we're doing now is scratching the surface of some of these capabilities. Certainly underwhelming, but now let's just check. You know what? I do want to implement support for post. Take a guess as to how I can implement support for not get, but post. Yeah, OK, request is the let's, uh, let's get everything. But for now, yeah, it turns out there's another variable, super global, as it's called. It's a global variable. You get it for free just because you're writing in PHP on the web. Post, this thing should now work too. Something random, Google search. Your query was, what, what, what? Oh, did I make a typo in Google? Oh, yeah. OK, let's see, search. Let's try this once more. Oh, and I didn't reload either. Sorry. So let me reload my own page. And Firefox does this. Even though you reload the page, it often leaves your value there. But so be it. There it is. Now it's working with post. But notice, there's no PHP code in what's being spit out. So herein lies the interpreted nature of PHP. Even though I have very clearly commingled PHP with XHTML, Everything that's between the open bracket question mark PHP and the close question mark uh, question mark close bracket disappears because it's precisely that chunk of code that's interpreted, so to speak, by the PHP interpreter. It's converted to whatever the output's supposed to be. In this case, just a string. Your query was colon something or other, and then it's the raw content that's actually returned. So this is one of the reasons PHP is so popular for web-based languages. One. You can really just start intermingling it with your original XHTML code. Now, this isn't necessarily the best thing, because now we're mixing presentation with logic. So we'll talk later in the course about uh, things like MVC, model view controller, and sort of cleaner ways of commingling code with XHTML. But for now, we're going to keep it simple. But you can very clearly output a web page, part of which is dynamic, just by including between tags, PHP tags, the code you actually want to spit out. We can be even more dynamic still, or more flexible. If I don't know in advance what's coming in, I'm going to actually do this now. So I know in advance I want to print out recursively everything in this array. So get is just an array. I want to print out everything in there, just maybe for debugging purposes. And frankly, this is actually a useful trick. Let me go ahead now and type in manually the following. Let's see, we're supporting get. So that means I should be able, in my URL up here, to type in question mark q equals foo, hit enter. And OK, it's a little weird looking, but we'll tease that apart in a second. How do I put another parameter in here? OK, so ampersand, uh, I did q. Let's do p equals bar, enter. OK, so there's more stuff in there. Let's do one more. So ampersand r equals baz, enter. OK, now this is actually, if we look at the source code, meant to look a little prettier. So one other, frankly, useful debugging trick when at least experimenting with this stuff at first, 
You won't often use the preformatted tag, but for this purpose, it's actually very nice. So what you're seeing now is the output of this print underscore r, print recursive function, that's just spitting out the contents of, a, of a, an array. And what's really powerful about PHP and this function in particular, you can print out the contents of any structure, whether it's an object in an OOP sense, whether it's an array, associative array, it does it recursively. So you really see what's inside your data. Right now, completely boring. But when you start implementing more complicated data structures or in two weeks when we play with XML data, there's definitely going to be some hierarchy. And you'll be able to visualize it more uh, easily, even with something simple like that. So we talked about SUPHP. Let's talk a little bit about the features of PHP so itself so we know what to expect moving on. So one, let's get this out of the way. A variable, as we've seen, begins with a dollar sign. There are some super globals, though, that you get for free simply by um, uh, using PHP itself, which we'll summarize in just a moment. But if you ever needed a reference for what a variable is in PHP, there, in fact, is the list. But it's probably a familiar setup. This is a more interesting discussion, data types. So PHP is very loosely data typed. There are types in PHP, but you don't declare them explicitly. And there's a lot of implicit conversion that goes on. So if you have the, uh, the string, quote unquote, one, you can actually add quote unquote one plus the integer two, and you'll get back an answer three. So there's a lot of that going around. And that's kind of a good thing in this context of the web, because as you've seen from these requests, every piece of data that's coming into your program as input at the end of the day is in what data type? It's a string, right? It's text. It's not an int, even though it might look like an int. It's not binary, even though it might be zero, look like zeros and ones. And so this is actually kind of a reasonable thing, I would argue, in PHP, in that you're dealing with strings anyway. Why be too hard and fast with data types? But you can nonetheless distinguish them. And you might have glimpsed from the uh, documentation for the count function that the manual will specify what data types are returned. So data types exist, but there is, again, a lot of commingling of them. So if you want to declare a variable that stores the number 2, you say something like x equals 2 semicolon. You don't specify a prefix. You don't say int, char, string, nothing. You just say dollar sign. Um, and meanwhile, we have already at our disposal some automatic variables. But these are the data types you'll come across in the documentation. And what is useful, as we'll see, as you get a little more comfortable with this, is, um, and I'll point this out now just because it's kind of neat if you've never seen it, this operator in most languages means what? Assignment, right? And we've all made the stupid mistake of accidentally using it for equality. But you know, equality is really this. Eh, PHP takes it to this level. What's this? JavaScript actually has this too. Uh, checking for sure is a nice casual way of saying it, but this is the, ident um, the identity operator. It's checking whether something is identical. So identical both in value and in type. So we'll see. And this is really a sneak preview of something that's actually kind of neat when you really start getting comfortable coding stuff up in PHP. What's kind of neat, if a bit sloppy, about PHP is that a function can return different data types. It can return a string almost always. But if something goes wrong, it can return the Boolean false. But how do you distinguish the Boolean false and the return value of 0, or quote unquote 0? Right here in lies the problem. So especially when it comes to return values, and this is why the, I point this out now just because it'll make some of the documentation a little more clear, because you'll see this function can return an array, a string, or false. It's a little strange, but what you can do then is check the return values of functions as follows. You can say, all right, I know foo, some function, could return 0. But I really want to check for false, because false denotes, according to the documentation, something bad happened. Well, you would simply do this. So if foo uh, equals, equals, equals false, then you go ahead and handle your error. And this would be different from this, because this would also evaluate to true if what was returned? False or zero or quote unquote zero or null or a whole bunch of other things. So it's kind of neat if you've never seen this feature before. But again, just beware that's, uh, be aware that that's why it exists. So you can distinguish types. Um, the URLs we've included here are really um, 
recommendations for reading. So this is sort of the place to begin. If, if you're the type that likes to curl up with a reference and doesn't want to sort of learn PHP piecemeal or by experimentation, but really just want to read from front to back, what can this language do? What's the syntax? This would be the first place to start. It's the language reference. And it sort of a, just walks you through what's a for loop, what's a while loop, how does it work in PHP, the stuff that Frankly, I think would be a little boring to go through in uh, minor examples in lecture. And here's a good reference. If you want to know what features the language supports and so forth, another good reference. It's all on php.net, but it's good sort of nighttime reading or over lunch because it's probably pretty easy, but at least you'll just get a, a dump from the website as to what you can do with this language. But more interesting are some of these features, these so-called super globals. So everything on this list here is a variable that you sort of automatically have access to just by writing stuff inside of a .php file. And I've used two of these already, get and post. Uh, suggested a moment ago was the underscore request variable. The request variable actually has everything from get and everything from post all together, which means you can support get and post together without even knowing or caring about how it comes in. I would generally promote um, not using requests and use get or post only because you're then at least exercising more control over your code. It's more deterministic. And again, you can then ignore, perhaps as Google does, like post requests if there's just no need to actually support them. Um, we'll see more of these details in a bit, especially session next week. But let me show you this one. I'm going to use my little quick and dirty thing here. Let's see what's inside of server, because there's actually some juicy stuff there. Let me reload. And there's a whole lot of stuff that your script always has access to. So just to give you a sense, apparently revealed to your code just by way of this variable is stuff like where your code exists, like that first line there, document root. Uh, it's telling me what's some of this stuff is pretty useless, but one thing should jump. Whoops, one thing should jump out at you. This thing here, even Apache knew about that. Remember that percent sign curly brace HTTP host? I use that in my HT access file. So it too is exposed to your code. Uh, redirect status. So this, whoops, this is a good thing here. Uh, 200 means that was a good request. Here's the remote IP address. If you like freaking people out just by telling them what their IP address is, that's very easily accessible to you in this language. Um, here's that somewhat useless string that's in my HTTP.conf file that we saw earlier tonight in the Apache config, my webmaster address, and a whole bunch of other stuff. This is useful, though, because you have um, lower level access to certain details. If you're writing a site that needs to support multiple domain names, for instance, Facebook used to have its URLs like harvard.facebook.com, mit.facebook.com. Odds are they didn't have a separate server, a separate code base for each and every school, but rather the same server was responding to these requests because all those DNS names resolved to the same host. But probably they had a line of code that said, if the HTTP host is MIT, show them the MIT network else if equals equals harvard.edu or harvard.facebook.com show them this. So some of these low-level details are useful, but even more powerful we'll see next week are things like the session super global and the cookie uh, super global, which lets you do some really neat things with state. Uh, PHP supports arrays, needless to say. And PHP comes with the kitchen sink of PHP of uh, array related functions. Uh, we looked at count a moment ago, but you may have noticed that unlike a language like C or even JavaScript, I mean, the number of built in, the amount of built in functionality to this language is remarkable. And almost always, if you need to do something, it's already been handed to you um, in the library. And it's a lot more, frankly, uh, um, findable than say uh, Javadoc, so to this day I don't know half of what's in the Java language, but it's a little more readily accessible I would argue in PHP, which is good for learning purposes because it's much easier to bootstrap yourself I think with this stuff. Loops has some probably familiar syntax, the for loop, while loop, do while, for each, and I would again refer you mostly to like the online reference just to see some of the syntax. For the most part I'll certainly use examples in forthcoming weeks of for loops, but I'm not going to belabor the point as to where the semicolons go for instance, and you will see um, next week that we can certainly do much more powerful things. We'll start off, I think, with an example of how to implement your own login mechanism, username and password, and remember that that user is logged in. And then we'll ramp up and ultimately, in the weeks to come, integrate an actual database to that request. So let's formally wrap here, but I will stick around for any one-on-one -on -one questions. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>